Hey guys, Chris here, and I'm a Ukrainian Canadian. Today is May 7th, 2024, and let's get to the news happening in Ukraine, shall we? This is going to be a very quick video. And before I begin, guys, if you enjoy my content, please subscribe to my channel, like my videos, and leave me a comment about today's topics uh, because you're helping me grow as a channel and also help continue spreading pro Ukrainian information and the pro Ukrainian narratives that we absolutely need to continue. Uh, spreading. So let's begin because there's two topics I want to talk about today. And number one is, of course, you guys saw my community post today on YouTube, really perplexed, but also angry to a certain extent, because which one is it, Macron? You guys remember my previous video, Macron last week uh, had very strong statements against Russia, made it look like they were about to help Ukraine and send troops very, very soon which obviously we know that it won't happen. But again, if you guys remember as well, my previous video, I talked about, yeah, it's great that you're making these statements, but it's also about, um, you know, actions speaking much louder than words. And so here, from what I see is that the uh, willingness from the French government to actually commit to helping Ukraine uh, is ve on very shaky grounds. So. You guys have seen my YouTube community post talking about basically France um, sending their ambassador to essentially congratulate Putin's uh, inauguration, which was today. And, you know, amongst this list, it's not just France, but you have Greece, Cyprus, Malta, Hungary, and Slovakia. You know, I I'm not surprised by Hungary and Slovakia and maybe Cyprus, but for sure Greece is another disappointment. But it's not as big of a deal compared to France actually sending one of their ambassadors. Uh, to me, it's very disappointing news because it only discredits as well the statements that Macron made, right? We all had this kind of optimistic view that France is going to step up. And I do believe that they're stepping up in certain areas. But when you're sending an ambassador to congratulate a dictator that is very close to uh, whether it be Hitler or even Stalin, of course, it's not the same level and scale, but for sure, he is a dictator and very oppressive one that has killed uh, hundreds of thousands of people indirectly and directly. And here you're just sending ambassadors for his inauguration, pretty much legitimizing his reign, which has been pretty much will be for 30 years if he survives uh, this uh, latest term. So for 30 years, he's basically been called the president, which we know he isn't. He's a Tsar. And it's extremely disappointing, again, to see that France decided to send an ambassador. Uh, and I believe that part of this issue is the fact that France still has and operates businesses within Russia. Let's not forget that they have a lot of um, country, uh, not countries, but companies, French companies, that yes, in the recent uh, backlash that they've received, some of them have pulled out only recently. But some of them are still doing business. You can see that Vinci, Sanofi, Auchan, Bonduel, uh, Carrefour, Engie, Lacoste, Lactalis, Yves Rocher. So there's lots of companies that are still operating in Russia, French ones, and they don't have any plans of, you know, moving anytime soon. So this is very concerning. And I think this is part of the reason why France is still trying to somewhere uh, normalize relationships with Russia because they're scared of just having all these businesses taken away and nationalized by Putin's regime, which is the risk that we have taken in believing that Russia somehow will be a democratic country, which clearly they're not. And so Russia needs to be isolated like North Korea and uh, in Iran. There's no other way around it. We cannot continue to do business with Russia and, and legitimizing Putin's reign, right? Every time there's a foreign company doing business like Lacoste or Sanofi, it only reminds the Russians that what we're doing is fine because look, France is doing business in our country. Oh, look, China is doing business in our country, which I'm not surprised China will continue to do business no matter what happens. But American companies, which are there's, I believe there's still some, um, to a certain extent, there's a lot of European companies as well, not just in France, they're doing business in Russia. So it's problematic. It's problematic that we're still allowing the Russians uh, to feel like it's okay. You know, nobody, it's not as catastrophic as we thought it would be, which leads me to the next point uh, being uh, the Russians coming to terms with Putin's war in Ukraine, with the inauguration. Now we're well over 27 months of uh, this conflict, this war that Russia has started in Ukraine, this full scale war. 
you can see that well pretty much there's no going back for the russians they have voiced their support and they have chosen the path of uh becoming a nazi germany the russians are no different than nazi germany and they're heading towards that direction they're now threatening not only ukraine but they're threatening other countries in europe um, and even outside of Europe, that they're going to nuke them, they're going to invade them, they're going to destroy them because they decided that they wanted to take a different path than the one that Russia has told them to take. So uh, this is the situation. This is the reality. Many people that perhaps are watching me are having still optimistic ideas about the Russian society, that they can change. They can transform themselves into a democracy. Just give them the chance. This is Putin's war, not the Russian people's war. And you're going to hear that very often from Russian liberals. You know, the so-called Russian liberals. And I call them so-called because they're fakers and they're victimizers. They like to victimize themselves saying that, look how much pressure we must deal with and how oppressive the Putin regime is. There's absolutely no way we can rebel against him. As if the Ukraines right now have a choice. They're being brutally killed every single day. Nurses, doctors, school teachers, basic civil, you know, any type of civilians are being targeted by the Russians every single day. And they can voice these opinions, but the Russians can, and we need to feel bad for the Russians, but not for the Ukrainians. I have absolutely no sympathy at this point left for the Russian people. They're pulling out these types of very you know, embarrassing narratives. Because in, in reality, there is a choice. Even though, yeah, at this point for Russia, it's going to be bloody. And it sucks. And I wish there was another way. But that's what they've allowed to happen. For decades, they were turning their eyes on the side. They weren't looking. They weren't looking at what was going on in their country and how oppressive, how brutal, how un forgiving the Putin regime has become and throughout the years it was evident and they just let it happen and you can see here in this article it's talking about now schools in uh, in Russia many children are sending gifts and letters to frontline soldiers and I've seen even drawings their kids are making of beheaded uh brutally killed Ukrainian uh, soldiers or even citizens right some of the writings uh on these drawings they're made by kids in schools or kill the hachols, right? The derogatory term that they, um, they use to, uh, to describe Ukrainians. Kill them all, destroy them, right? These are kids at a very young age already being thought to hate the Ukrainians and kill them and dehumanize them, right? So this is one thing. Public sentiments about the social economic situation are at the level of 2008. And if you guys remember, it was the period of uh, the Georgian invasion uh, by Russia. And while well, nobody stepped up in Russia against it, there was some some protests here and there. But then again, the Russians just kind of looked on the side with regards to the Georgian invasion. And you can see that the peak of Putin's stability was during that time as well, where gas prices were really high. Uh, the Russians were making money, right? Capital, foreign capital was coming into Russia in, you know, thousands of investors in Russia, right? Russia was really growing and the Russians were really happy about that. And now the state is spending huge resources on creating the feeling that everything is in order. And there's a huge consumer boom as well, because while well, you have hundreds of thousands of men, they're either, either killed or wounded. And they're just a high need of um, labor and salaries are increasing. So for the Russians, it's even better to a certain extent to have this happen, uh, this war happen, because a lot of them, they're still living in Russia, can uh, now see their salaries triple if not even go even higher than that, because there's such a shortage of labor, especially amongst the, the more male-dominated sectors, like you know construction work, engineers, things like that. And support among ordinary Russians for peace talks tends to rise only when the army experiences battlefield reverses in Ukraine, said uh, Snegovaya, uh, who's, a, I guess, a scholar in the Center of Strategic International Studies. Even when they back negotiations, many insist on retaining territories that Russian troops now occupy in Ukraine and that Putin has declared forever part of Russia. So uh, you can see that the only way for the situation to change in Russia is if Ukraine wins or is becoming much more stronger and is having far more victories uh, against Russia, which is possible only if the West 
continuously supports Ukraine, right? This is based on the very important condition. And a very important factor is that Europe and the United States continuously back Ukraine with weaponry, financial assistance, because you can only understand how difficult it is right now for the Ukrainians to not only fight this war, but also fight within because there's lots of corruption in Ukraine, also retaining some sort of normal normalcy in Ukraine. Teachers, medics, police, um, you know, basic laborers, any type of civilians are trying to live normally. And that is difficult when you know that a few hundred kilometers away from you at the at best, um, there is a massive brutal invasion going on. And these people, these Russians, won't think twice if they are victorious. They invade large cities like Kharkiv, like Dnipro, and they start committing mass genocide because this time they won't be forgiving the Russians. After 27 months, over two years of fighting, and you think now they're going to be, oh, after all, we're, you know, we're a one nation. Me bratia. Adin narod, as they say, one nation. You think they're going to be doing that to Ukraine, to the Ukrainians and saying that to them? You really think that? They're going to be so brutal and everybody's going to be shocked if that happens. And God forbid it happens. God forbid it happens. But that is all in the West. Because if you want to live comfortably, you better be back in Ukraine. And so Russia, as I said, chose its path. There's no turning back anymore. There's no more. And I'm not even hearing any of these uh, talks about uh, oh, you know, this is Putin's war, the Russians, look at them, they're victims, none of that. Maybe we're generalizing, but after a certain time, during World War II, we were generalizing the Germans. Was, was there good German people in World War II that were against Hitler? Yeah. But we didn't have time to separate the bad Germans and the good Germans. Unfortunately, it got to the point where it's either we destroy them or they will absolutely annihilate us and they'll commit such crimes on us that that's it. So unfortunately, that's the situation with Russia. They've allowed themselves to become this monster and don't buy into their victimization mindset because it works. And some people, you know, fall to these, you know, sad stories of, uh, you know, poor Russians complaining outside of Russia that have fled but are doing absolutely nothing to help the Ukrainians. Nothing not investing into fundraisers to help the Ukrainians survive this brutal war. I haven't seen any of them. Very few of them are actually doing something, which is unfortunate because I was optimistic in the beginning of this conflict that there was millions of Russians that would come out and stop Putin and that this war would end within six months. And look where we're at right now. We're heading to year number three, and I bet you it's going to be even longer than that, unfortunately. So we don't have the choice but to generalize, unfortunately, this current situation. The Russian society, which is, as you can see here, fully supportive of this war, either by claiming they're supporting it or either be not uh, saying anything about it, right? Being scared or hiding or making up another excuse as to why they didn't do anything. They're supportive of this war. So that's the default situation in Russia. And I hope you guys enjoyed my video updates. Let me know what you think in the comment section about of course, this article and uh, France being present during uh, Putin's inauguration to me, it's disappointing, but it is the way it is. So we'll see you guys in the next one. Thank you for support. Slava Ukraini.